Good morning. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the rain that we are having in this spring season. Our farmers and gardeners are so grateful for the moisture that is needed for the crops and gardens to grow and thrive. The rain is also needed on a deeper level for our underground water table, as well as for the lakes and rivers that run through our lands. Father, may we ask for your help for funding for the camps that run each summer and for the Youth for Christ programs. The funding from the government has been cut off and these programs are needed. Uh, these funds, uh, uh, these pro and these programs are need for funds to feed our youth's minds on your word where they are not heard, where they have, may not have heard about you elsewhere or in their homes. These funds are necessary for staffing, food, and other operational costs. We know that the camps and the Youth for Christ programs are vital to spread your love and your word to these children and adults. Father, we pray for all the students who are graduating this year, whether it is from high school, university, or any secondary education programs. We pray that the young adults may find a career in their chosen fields, and we pray also for those young adults who don't have a clear path for their lives, that they may find a job that would help them grow and not leave their faith behind. We ask that you give them a clear vision for their lives after school. Father, we pray for all the countries who are still at war or have conflicts with other nations. We ask for protection for all the people still in those countries. We pray that the wars and the conflicts will end soon. We pray for those in the mission fields where they are risking their lives when they are even talking about you that can bring, you de can bring death or imprisonment. We ask for your guidance and protection so that they may show people in these countries your love and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Father, we thank you for Pastor Jedediah and Pastor Jennifer and the staff here at church. We are grateful that we can hear your word in messages that teach us the truth about who you are and how we can serve you with our whole hearts and minds. Let our pastoral team not grow weary of their calling of serving you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I, wow. so I have an idea. Uh, you might not have a problem hearing me, as I said before, but if you do and you're wondering, wow, I, I, I'm having a difficulty, in case you're not aware, if you came late, uh, where speakers are gone, we've got one little tiny speaker projecting this whole thing on the floor here for us, and I want to thank the sound team for putting this together at the last minute. It went out about 30 minutes before the service. So we'll figure it out for next week, but I want to say, I noticed there's a lot of, of room up here in the front, right, John? Are you seeing that? So if you're saying, I'm having a hard time hearing today, don't you worry, we've got a solution for you. The speaker's right here. You just come right to the front, and we're here for you, okay? All right, good. Uh, I just want to make a really clear announcement. Translators, are you good? Are you ready for this? So good. Okay, I've got the wave from the translators. Here's the deal. I realized on Thursday when I was at the park with our youth and parents were picking up their children, their youth, I realized many of the parents did not know that there is a picnic coming up. And I want you to know, we just... Uh, we're, was it, we were at the site where the picnic is going to be this summer. We were going to do three of them once a month. And the site is beautiful. It's got full covering. It's got a field. We're going to have a soccer game going on. It has a five, two fire pits. So if you want to bring something and roast some hot dogs or I don't know, whatever it is, we've got it taken care of. We finally got the premium site at Assiniboine. We had to put the reservation in really early. But here's what I want to say to all of you. This is happening, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. I don't know about you, I'm a father. I would love to go and have a picnic. So fathers, let's go. We're gonna encourage our family, let's all go, not this Sunday, but next Sunday to our church picnic. In the bulletin, on our Church Connect, on our website, you can talk to me. We have it pinged on Google Maps. We have the location for you. Here's what I want to talk to you about. 
I realize that we haven't addressed the picnic because I just presume we all know about it, and that's a mistake. I want to say this. Usually our picnics are very international. I get a little bit of food from all these different countries, and I love it. So here's what I'm asking of you. Bring food for, your, for you and your family and a little extra because Pastor Jedediah likes to have a little bit. I mean, no, and others too. So please, please, we would love for you to be there. We had a blast, our youth, on Thursday. We believe you will love it. And if you don't want to play soccer or frisbee or volleyball or whatever, don't worry. We have covering. We have picnic tables. There's plenty of space for you to just sit there and enjoy a meal and have fellowship. Uh, the next... Uh, important point to this picnic is I realize, as you'll notice, even our church today, uh, many people are taking the bus and they get here. And sometimes they get here a little later because of the bus schedule. Uh, I, we do not want transportation to be an issue for why you are not able to come to this picnic. And so I'm asking of you, church family, if you have vehicles, I'm sort of just trusting, you know, we only have a couple loaves and and, and some fish that it's going to multiply. But I'm asking of you, if you have a vehicle, I would ask, can you be a ride for someone here? Because there are many people, especially some that have come recently to Canada, that do not have a vehicle yet. And I want to make sure that we can get them to the picnic. I'm bringing an extra car. Uh, I also bring some extra car seats for children. And if you have that ability, could you be that for the church and serve in this capacity? Uh, we are just going to have next week a little lineup in the foyer uh, of people that need rides, and we're just going to go. So if that is you, if the Lord puts that on your heart and you say, yes, I want to be a ride for someone, thank you, thank you. And uh, we're going to coordinate that next week in the foyer. So... I think I've said enough about the picnic. Uh, there's a few other items I need to talk about. We have men's breakfast. Men, I love our men's breakfast. Last time we had 33 of us men. We want to see more there. Uh, it is right here in the lower auditorium. We make it ourselves. We clean up ourselves. Praise the Lord. And we would love for you to join us. The difference this week is that it's not the last Saturday of the month. A year ago, we had a rental that reserved that time in that space, and we can't cancel now on them. So we are going to be uh, having men's breakfast on June 22nd, not the last Saturday of the month. Uh, I think I've forgotten something else. I know I have. Winnipeg Walks, thank you so much, Marilyn. That is coming up. That is this coming, is it this coming Saturday? So once again, I will just plug Winnipeg Walks. I thought, what is the point of this ministry? I remember Norman and Marilyn talking to me about it and going, well, this is an absolute failure. Like, who would actually go to this? And then I realized it's amazing. I went myself because I saw lots of people going to it. And the fellowship... I got to learn a lot about the city, specifically if you're new to, Can to Winnipeg, I would encourage you to go to this because you learn about Winnipeg and areas of Winnipeg that I had been in Winnipeg for years and I did not know existed. So this is a great time. It's a wonderful fellowship and uh, I hope we all can make it to it. All right, that is it. I'm not going to say anything more other than I am so thankful that we have a moderator that is willing to share God's word. What was that, John? Oh, children. Oh, yes. Kids in the word. The last. Kids in the word. Children, go. Go to your classrooms. I've got the teachers back there. Thank you, John, for the cue. Uh, so I, I'm so thankful we have John Newfeld, our moderator, who's willing to share. And he has this theme. And today it's the letter F is being brought to you all. And so let's put our hands together. Let's welcome John.
can't even get into a car without feeling a sense of panic because they're closed in. There's a fear of failure, which can prevent you from doing anything that you want. There's a fear of failure, which can prevent us from trying things like signing up for a class or trying out for a team or applying for a job. There are relational fears which can prevent us or can cause us to sabotage our relationships with other people and to keep them away from us. Fear can paralyze us, keeping us from making decisions, keeping us from being involved, and freezing us in place when we really need to move. That is not the kind of fear I want to focus on, though. There is also healthy fear. A number of years ago, I was a camp counselor at Camp Arnis, north of the city. It was a particularly hot night. The cabin was not air-conditioned, and my boys were not sleeping. So I decided that we would all take our sleeping bags and go out to the beach, where it was much cooler. We got an amazing show of what God can do. We were on the west shore of Lake Winnipeg, and on the eastern shore, there was a line of thunderstorms. You could see the lightning. It was far enough away we couldn't hear the thunder, so it was absolutely quiet, but just amazing light show across the lake. Above us, the sky was clear, stars everywhere, but we also had a meteor shower going on, so every now and then, every few minutes, we'd see a shooting star. And if we looked to the north end of the lake, we could see the northern lights, pink and green, dancing around in the sky. My boys, most of them, grew up in the city, where the lights dim the stars and you can't really see them, where buildings block the view of the distance and you can't see what's on the horizon. They were absolutely amazed, and so was I. I had never seen all three of those things at the same time. But it demonstrated that nature is actually a masterpiece created by God and it emphasized his ascendance and our small place in the world. When the Bible says, fear the Lord your God, it does not mean be afraid of God. It means we are to revere and respect the Lord God Almighty for being the creator God that he is. Charles Swindoll said, fear of the Lord refers to the posture of reverence, worship, and respect that we ought to have toward God. It means living our lives in light of what we know of him, holding him in the highest estimation and depending on him in humble trust. Only then, Proverbs teaches us, will we discover true knowledge and wisdom." End quote. The book of Proverbs is considered a wisdom book. What does that mean? Proverbs does what no other book in the Bible does. It gives us short instructions for living a life of wisdom here on earth. Other books of the Bible deal with complex theological truths. They give us stories of the success or failure of peoples or nations, or it relates prophetic preaching. Proverbs is more of an instruction manual than it is a history book or a theology book. There are 31 chapters in Proverbs, one for every day of the, our longest month. So if there's 31 days in a month, you could read a proverb every day. Consider my sermon from last year called R&B, Read Your Bible. Reading a proverb a day was probably a good idea. It certainly wouldn't hurt. Early in Proverbs, we read the following. In chapter one, verse five, it says, let the wise listen to, those, to these proverbs and become even wiser. And verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. Proverbs 9 verse 10 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. We've already mentioned in this context, fear of the Lord is a reverence for God, an acknowledgement that he is clearly and obviously above us, demanding our worship and respect. It is a mindset and attitude that should affect everything we do. I think we all know a group of people who experienced much of what I've spoken of so far. The disciples of Jesus were ordinary men who left their vocations to follow him. Even when they were right beside him, they had occasions to be afraid. Matthew chapter eight 
23 to 27, tells us a story. When Jesus got into the boat and started to cross the lake with his disciples, suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Following the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciples were very afraid. One of them, Judas Iscariot, had committed suicide. Their unofficial leader, Peter, had lied and fled from the questions of a servant girl. They had believed that Jesus was going to revive the nation of Israel. And when he died, so did their vision of the future. Where were these men who had studied under Jesus, who had walked on water, cast out demons, preached his message? They were hiding, afraid and dispirited. What happened to those men during that time? A radical new understanding of what Jesus had been telling them all along. He had taught them about himself from the scriptures. He had demonstrated to them how he was the fulfillment of prophecy. And he told them to accomplish his ministry, he needed to die and rise again. That was the part they couldn't get. Up to that point, it was easy for them to follow along and agree, but on the subject of his death and resurrection, it made no earthly sense. And like most of us, they simply passed over that part of his message until it hit him in the face. When the truth of what Jesus was telling them was plainly and forcefully brought to their attention, the same Jesus that they had seen killed and buried stood among them and talked to them. Finally, the truth dawned on them, and it all started to make sense. Seven weeks after they were hiding in a dark room, they were walking the streets of Jerusalem, boldly proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body away and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and when he went in, he saw and believed, for until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Note that we read the Bible, the disciples had not understood the scriptures. Even though they had read them or heard them and been taught them by Jesus, they still had not understood. Seeing the empty tomb finally made the connection and they saw and believed. Yet, later that night, if we read further into John's account, the picture for the disciples still was not clear. John chapter 20, 19 to 23. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The disciples had grown up as Jews. They had been taught the scriptures. They had an understanding of Jewish history and the promises and prophecies that foretold the coming of the Messiah. And yet, even as they lived when these prophecies were coming true, they did not understand what was happening. 
They are no different from you and I. How many of us have read our Bibles, listened to sermons, gone to Bible camp, heard the gospel message in different ways in different places, and we still don't get it. We still don't understand what God has done for us. We don't understand what Jesus Christ has done for us. The result is often fear. We're afraid to share the good news of the gospel because we do not depend and rely on God to help us, to direct us and protect us. Jeremiah 1, 7 and 8 says, the Lord replied, don't say I am too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you, and do not be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Have you ever wondered if you have anything in common with the disciples? I think a lot of us tend to think of, think of them as somehow better equipped or more qualified to serve than we are. If you look at them before Jesus' death and resurrection, you'll find that you and they are pretty much the same. Flawed, sometimes anxious, sometimes angry, sometimes afraid. In the first few days after Jesus' death, the disciples were in hiding, fearful of the Jewish leaders. They were not the bold, spirit-filled men who spread the gospel and grew the early church. They had an advantage none of us have had. They heard Jesus directly, spent time with him, learned from him, witnessed his miracles, and still, the night that he rose from the dead, they were hiding in a dark room, afraid. And then Jesus appeared, talked with them, ate with them, showed them his wounds, and gave them the Holy Spirit. They went from fear to faith, and in faith, They boldly shared the good news of Jesus and changed the world. What do we need to experience to move from fear to faith? Psalm 27, one and two tells us, the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. Why should I tremble? Psalm 34, four and five says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Fear, faith, failure. How are they linked? How are they unique? If we fear God, that is, have an awe and respect for God, it builds faith. The Bible tells us that faith can move mountains. If we do not fear God, that leads to failure. Failure to live lives worthy of respect. Failure to live lives that make a positive difference in the world. How do we move from fear to faith? How do we build a life of fearing the Lord God Almighty? I think a clear, a clean, uh, sorry, a clear piece of that process is prayer. Pastor Jedediah has shared with us the struggles and failures of Abraham. Abraham was able to see the big picture and believe that God would bless him. But in the day-to-day details of his life, he couldn't see past his own problems and his own solutions. And because of that, he failed big time more than once. I think one of the big contributors to that was his failure to pray. Failure to bring God into the everyday matters of life, both good and bad. James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Philippians 4, verse 6 tells us, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. In a sermon, Pastor Alistair Begg said, when we don't pray, we say with our lives that we consider prayer to be supplemental, not fundamental. God's work, done God's way, will never lack God's supply. And God's way to do it is to move men's hearts by prayer. This past year, we've taken a few days where we called you to a day of prayer. 
Some of you came early in the morning, some late in the evening, some during the day. My reasoning for encouraging us to do that was exactly in line with what Pastor Begg said. God's way to move men's hearts is through prayer. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. The enemy we face is sometimes bold and in our face, but oftentimes is subtle and hiding in the dark. On our own, or even as a church, we are ill-equipped to fight that fight unless we are dependent on God to go before us and with us. The world in which we live is full of deceit, misdirection, a message of self-reliance and self-gratification. You are not able to stand against that without God's help. When I was thinking of fear and how it affects people, I considered that there is a healthy fear. Healthy fear keeps us from going places we know we should not go. Healthy fear keeps us avoiding activities or people we know will harm us. Fear of the Lord our God is a healthy fear. It acknowledges our dependence on God for wisdom and knowledge, strength and courage. Fear of the Lord reinforces God's deserved place as above all and above us in particular. What are you afraid of? Illness, unemployment, loneliness? Where are you putting your faith? In yourself or in God, the God who made you and loves you? The Bible is full of stories that show us the benefits of fearing and trusting God and the perils and consequences of ignoring or sidelining God. A clear example is found in 2 Chronicles, where we read about what happened to two generations of kings, father and son. Both of them started their reign fearing God, and both lost their kingship because they gave up that relationship with God. Amaziah sought God's guidance early in his reign, but he became arrogant and sinned against God, leading to his downfall, capture, and eventual assassination. His son Uzziah took his throne when he was only 16 years old. 2 Chronicles 26, verses 3 to 5. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem, He did what was right and pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Note that last sentence. As long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. As a teenager, Uzziah had seen his father's kingdom start with success and end in disaster. He took instruction from the prophet Zechariah, and it served him well until he started taking credit for his own success. 2 Chronicles 26 verse 10 says, When he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. What fascinates me and troubles me about Uzziah's story is that here is an example of someone who saw the rise and fall of his father, who knew better than to follow that example, and yet did it anyway, with tragic results. How often does that story repeat itself in scripture, throughout history and even in our lives today? We see God blessing others, and maybe even ourselves, And then we see people's lives come apart when they stray away from God. This should concern us all and be a driving force to keep us humble and seeking God, especially when things are going well. There is a saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. What that refers to is that when we are out of options and have no control of our situation and are afraid, we turn to the to God to help us, and he does. The real concern is what happens after that. Do we give God the credit, or do we take credit for ourselves or just say it was coincidence and God had nothing to do with it? Or do we say thank you to God and then ignore him? 
Maybe it's more subtle than that. We don't actually decide to ignore God. We just let it happen, kind of drift away. We allow life to get in the way and to consume our thoughts and our time until there's no room for God. The amazing thing about God, though, is that although he is supreme, he loves us. Even though he's omnipotent, he shows us mercy. And even though he is a just and holy God, he forgives us when we repent. Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 to 31. Don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow will fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. To sum up a little of what I've been sharing with you, fear is a part of life, both good and bad. In order for us to manage our fear, we need to trust God, who made us and loves us. We need to build up wisdom and courage, which comes to us from knowing God. And we get to know God by studying his word and taking time to pray. Seek understanding of the scriptures. Strive to be like the apostles after they understood Jesus' true purpose. Make prayer an essential part of your day, not an afterthought or an emergency call when life gets scary. Put your trust in God, not yourself or your family or your friends. Believe Jesus. Acknowledge your shortcomings and sinful nature. Repent and be forgiven. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. We are all confronted with a choice. That choice is to believe in Jesus Christ as God's son or not. And that choice comes with consequences, both immediate and eternal. And you cannot avoid those consequences, no matter what you think of them. Once you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you need to develop your relationship with him. You need to get to know him and find out what he expects of you. To do that, you need to read your Bible. Everything God wants you to know about himself and yourself is found in its pages. You need to read your Bible because you cannot be influenced by that which you do not know. No matter how long you've been a follower of Christ, whether one hour or 50, 60 years, it is important to know what you believe and why so that you can defend your faith. As you learn about God and work on your relationship with him, it is important to use the gifts that God has given you to honor him and serve his people. Sometimes those gifts put you in the spotlight or behind a pulpit. Sometimes they put you in the background where nobody notices you. But all of God's gifts and all of God's people are needed. One way that all of you can build a relationship with God and serve his people is by prayer. Prayer is the lifeline all Christians have access to. A way to talk to and hear from God that all of you can do anywhere, anytime. Alone, in a group, in a crowd, or in the church congregation. Pray like your life depends on it, because in some ways it does. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, to pray about everything. Think about it. God the Creator made everything around you and made you, yet he allows you to come to him and talk to him, to plead with him, to praise him, and even to complain. This morning, I wanted to show you a path from fear that harms you to a fear of God that saves and equips you. 
Put your trust and faith in the God who has kept all his promises from the beginning of time and who will continue to keep his promises even as they apply to you and take time to pray. To close, I want to share with you a passage of scripture from the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel 12, 23 to 25. As for me, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. And I will continue to teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. Let's take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have made yourself accessible to us, that you love us, you care for us, and you desire a fellowship with us. No matter how broken we might be, we can come to you and ask you to forgive us and to heal us, to equip us and use us to further your name and to further your kingdom. I ask, Lord God Almighty, that everyone who hears these words today would take time to find out whether what I say is true, that whether your word says is true. We ask for your guidance and your blessing. Amen. Let's stand and respond in song. We'll sing, No Longer Slaves to Fear.
seated. We have, uh, I was reminded, yes, I did. Is, is this on? This is on. Okay, good. I was reminded, yes, I did forget something. I need to share with the church family. Thank you for the person that reminded me of this. We have a marathon next week as well as a picnic. And the Manitoba, or is it the Winnipeg? I don't know who runs here. I don't know what they call it, but marathon. And for some of you, I know having people in short shorts running around scares you. It scares me too. It makes me want to turn them back and leave. But don't do it. Press in, even though it's going to be crowds of people hurting themselves running in a marathon. I'm just kidding. I know we have runners here that are so offended. I apologize to you. I know it's very good athletic physical activity. But regardless, I'm just saying to you, do not, do not turn, turn away. There's a big marathon. They pass through here. I want to have you please look at the bulletin. There's directions. If you're still unclear, come and talk to us. We will have people out there navigating you with the marathon uh, workers. And I want to also say, if, uh, if you would like to help us and be out there, uh, please come and find Jeremy. Jeremy, you're the contact. Raise your hand, Jeremy. Jeremy, right there. Go and talk to Jeremy. He'll make sure he gets you out there uh, and so that you can direct uh, the church family. Because literally, it's like right when our service starts, they're running through. And so it's a lot going on. And so we really do hope you'll press in. I know we have the live stream, but we'd love to see you and have you here. All right. I just wanted to say those few words, but I wanted to, what John's talking about is, you know, from the, the gospel, the good news is from Genesis to Revelation. And this is a story of redemption of God's, it's God's redemption story of his people. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, it does not waver. He is consistent. It doesn't waver with the fads of time that come and go. He is consistently good. We sang that today, for you are good. And so today, if you're here and you need prayer, if you're saying, I need to be seeking the Lord and trusting him, whatever might be going on in your life right now, you have a church family. This could be your first Sunday here. You have a church family that will pray with you and be here and support you and walk with you on your faith journey. And so I just want to ask the prayer team if they could come on up, please. And so you have people here that are willing to pray with you. And if you're listening to this on the live stream or you're here in the pews and you're saying, you know, I'd love to have further conversation about this faith, this walk with Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? If that is you, please come and find me. Come and find the prayer team. We are here to pray with you. We want to walk with you through uh, this entire journey you're on in this uh, faith that you are discovering in your life. And so please don't leave here today without prayer. We are here to support you and we want to be an anchor because this faith journey isn't just done in isolation. It's done in a community and we have each other to support each other and to walk with each other together through this uh, journey of being a Jesus follower. So I wanted to say all of that. Live stream people, you're listening to this right now. Uh, my contact information's on the screen. Just contact me. I would just in love to share more of my own story with you and get to know you more and more. So please do so. I think I've said everything. If you are a guest today, we have in the lower auditorium a wonderful... Uh, fellowship. It, you know, we have coffee and tea and some snacks and we call it Fellowship Cafe and we would love for you to join us right down in the lower auditorium. Please join us for further fellowship. Uh, we hope to see you there. Could I now have you all stand for the benediction?
Now to him who is able to do more than we could ever ask or even think according to the power at work within us, that is the Holy Spirit, to him be all glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all of the generations forever and ever. And can God's people please say, amen. Go in the empowerment of God's spirit. Amen.